Good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you all here today on this midsummer night. It is such a gratifying time to have so many lovers of Japanese ceramics with us tonight, despite the usual summer diversions and travel. I and my talented team remain committed to these panel programs, especially as it enables us to reach such a broad audience from across the country and around the globe. Furthermore, the recording of the event remains available on the internet for long, long thereafter. It will also be available on the Asia Week New York website, which is partnering with us tonight on the support and event. And we are most grateful to Asia Week for their help in making this panel discussion so widely known. The Zoom medium also enables us to bring together artists and experts from distant locations to join for a moment in time to both educate and captivate our audience. Indeed, we have over 460 registered viewers tonight, hailing from over 15 countries, including Australia, France, Japan, Germany, India, UK, even Romania and Ireland. Shout out to Joe and Charlotte, hopefully they're with us, and guests from over 30 states. The audience is comprised of over 24 curators and museum professionals from over 20 museums, plus numerous collectors, dealers, appraisers, art history professors, and quite a few clay artists waking up early in Japan to hear this live. And to them, ohayo gozaimasu. It is a great privilege and truly a special joy to celebrate the publication of the most impressive and illuminating book, Listening to Clay, Conversations with Contemporary Japanese Ceramic Artists, authored by dear friends and true Japanese ceramist enthusiasts, Halsey and Alice North, and the incomparable scholar, Louise Court. And we believe that there is no better way to honor them and their two decades of diligent work than to tangibly bring together recent clay vessels and sculptures for a very special exhibition by the 16 featured men and women, all leaders in the field whose work is collected by museums around the globe and to launch the celebratory exhibition. We are furthermore delighted to note that many of the works selected uh, for the show were picked by the artists themselves for this singular exhibition. Uh, which is presented both online in our, uh, on our website and in person in the gallery. Most of you are already very well aware that the long history of Japanese ceramics has cul uh, culminated in the current generation's creative and diversified transformation of traditional vessels into genuine contemporary art. It is the field's unmatched range, power, and sophistication together with the successful integration of old and new techniques and aesthetics in a medium that has brought this area to the collecting forefront in this country. Tradition and modernity are exquisitely balanced in each work of these artists. But how did America become so involved and impassioned by the seductive art form? Like many fields of art that are first noticed, then acquired, and then promoted, by visionary tastemakers, it requires a combined effort of collectors, dealers, scholars, and museum curators, and of course, committed and talented artists. Without a doubt, Louise Court and Halsey and Alice North have skillfully, patiently, and persistently filled a number of these roles and been effective cheerleaders for this remarkable field. Louise, with her scholarship and passion for the medium, has educated us through stimulating exhibitions, installations at the Freer, and countless insightful and highly readable publications. For me personally, her organization selection and farsightedness in bringing the Japan Ceramics Today Show exhibition of the Kikuchi Tomo Collection to the Smithsonian in 1983 was a life-changing opportunity and experience. Followed by her seminal work on the avant-garde Sodesha and Isama Noguchi, she paved the way and opened my eyes to the sculptural marvels of post-war Japanese clay art. And for all these gifts and so many others, I am truly indebted, Louise. 
But when she partnered as advisor, friend, and fearless collaborated with the dynamic duo of Halsey and Alice, the world of Japanese ceramics was to be changed forever. Having led ceramic tours for Japan Society in the 1990s, Halsey and Alice became ardent advocates for the field. Their amazing dinner parties, honoring the artists and their exhibitions at our gallery and elsewhere, were gracious del and delicious, and they offered the perfect venue for cementing relationships between the artists themselves, collectors, curators, and scholars. On a personal note, uh, these three advocates for the field open new doors for me as well. By expanding their collecting focus to include works by deceased masters, I managed to join them in 2004 at several visits together with a few friends of Asian art from the Freer Sackler Museum. Here you see our much younger selves. And also um, at the bottom in 2004, they asked me to help and uh, arrange and facilitate the acquisition of major Akiyama Yo works that were then shipped at great expense to Smith College for Sam Morse's confronting tradition, contemporary art from Kyoto. That process for me proved seminal as it brought the work in part funded by the Norths themselves, uh, the work of this enormously important artist to the attention of the American collecting uh, public. And as you will hear, these works were acquired by uh, major museums scattered across the country. Generous, impassioned, and committed collectors, they have financially supported traveling exhibitions and publications. In recent years, the Norths have donated a large proportion of their collection together with their library and archives of decades of correspondence, both in letters and photos with the artists uh, to the curators of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, making it a major resource for future scholars. In addition to the Met, the Norths have donated other important work from their collection to museums across the country. Another pillar to this foundation in Japanese ceramic art is Monica Binsick, who is the Met's curator of Japanese decorator, decorative arts, and the one with whom the Norths have worked extensively to cement their connection to this important institution. Her use of their collection and other gems from the museum's holding have brought a new audience to those wonderful balcony cases about which we shall soon hear. The acquisition of this crowd favorite work by the then youngster Fujikasa Satoko was supported by the, North, the Norths and then John Carpenter prior to Monica's appointment. Even more importantly, Halsey and Alice have inspired many others who have carried on the torch igniting enthusiasm at museums across the country and led to others following in their footsteps, many of whom are with us tonight for the celebration and include, I'll just mention a few, but I think most of the people here already know them. Uh, Carol and Jeffrey Horvitz, and Bob and Betsy Feinberg, Kurt and Alice Gitter, Paul and Kathy Bissinger, Phyllis Kempner and David Stein, Gordon Broadfuhr, David Frank and Kazukuni Sugiyama, and most recently, Joe and Nancy Keithley. But perhaps the greatest legacy of these three impassioned lovers of Japanese clay art will over time be this highly unusual, deeply personal and insightful look into the thoughts, experience and the opinions of many of the leading Japanese clay artists of the current generation of masters. With typical generosity and enthusiasm, these three authors are now blessed to offer in our gallery and online these selected works in recognition of their achievement. So let's get started. But first, a, a small matter of housekeeping. At the end uh, of the panelist discussion portion of tonight, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and as moderator, I'll ask as many of them as I can to our panelists, time allowing. And I'm delighted to say that uh, Halsey North is also joining us tonight, and he will be available alongside Alice to answer any questions. We're so glad you're with us, Halsey, and um, we're here to celebrate your many, many achievements. So let's get started. Um, 
I guess I should introduce um, uh, Al, uh, Louise more formally, although I, at this point it seems unnecessary. But uh, she is the Curator Emerita of Ceramics at the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and her specialties are historical contemporary ceramics of Japan, Southeast Asia, South Asia. And her countless publications include Shigaraki, Potter's Valley, Isamanaguchi and Modern Japanese Ceramics, Chigusa and the Art of Tea, and of course, Listening to Clay, Conversations with Contemporary Japanese Ceramic Artists. In 12, uh, 2012, she received the Secretary's Distinguished Scholar Award uh, from the Smithsonian Institution and the Koyama Fujio Memorial Prize for research on historical and contemporary Japanese ceramics. So Louise, uh, my first question goes to you, but of course, uh, to set the stage tonight uh, for a discussion about the new book and the current show at the Met, I would first like to ask you to tell us about the seminal 2003 exhibition on Noguchi and uh, the Sodesha movement and how it came together. Uh, it was simply a revelation for me personally, both the Noguchi show and the book have continued to have, have a profound impact on my perspective of post-war Japanese clay art and my subsequent direction in developing the field in this country. But personally, I would love to hear what you as the show's curator and the publication's principal author perceive as the resulting impact. How has it been on Western collectors, academicians, and curators now 30 years later after its publication? Louise? Thank you, Joan. It's wonderful to be here with you this evening. And before I answer your question, on behalf of Alice and Halsey and myself, um, Thank you to you for organizing this wonderful exhibition and the webinar that accompanies it that gives us a chance to celebrate our uh, Potter friends in Japan once again and to uh, bring more of their work to a public that can see it either online or in your gallery and maybe launch a few more collectors. Um, it's been very exciting to see this happen, and it's indeed part of your question about the impact of that long ago exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> Isamu Noguchi and Modern Japanese Ceramics, A Close Embrace of the Earth, that's a line from Noguchi, he was thinking of clay too, uh, took place in 2003 at the Sackler Gallery in Washington and then at the Japan Society Gallery in New York and the um, Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And I especially thank Alexandra Monroe, who was director of Japan Society Gallery at that time for giving us the title and also accepting the show. Uh, this was my first chance to really uh, dig into kind of conceptual problem relating to contemporary Japanese ceramics as opposed to historical ones. It offered many unknown areas to me, many challenges, and the pleasure of collaborating in particular with Bert Winter Tamaki, who knew a great deal about Noguchi as an artist, as a, as a person, and also with Bruce Altschuler, who was then the director of the Isama Noguchi Garden Museum, and Mimi Ryu, who was a curator at the Sezon Museum in Tokyo. And I have to mention the sheer delight of hunting for works for this exhibition, which was really a question of following out threads of personal connections among the artists we wanted to describe, uh, with Yagi Sakio, who's was the daughter-in-law of Yagi Kazuo, about whom we'll be speaking shortly, and an absolutely amazing person and companion. And in fact, we dedicated our book, Listening to Clay, to Sakio. But the exhibition about Noguchi and modern Japanese ceramics began with this earlier exhibition organized at the Sezon Museum in Tokyo 
uh, about is the connection between Isamu Noguchi and Kita Oji Rosanji, about whom you've heard recently on a webinar from the gallery. Um, Noguchi, I found through this catalog, I learned through this catalog, made ceramics at three times during visits to Japan. In 1931, when he worked in Kyoto with the family of Uno Nimmatsu, a distinguished Kyoto pottery family. In 1950, when he made ceramics in Seto. And finally, in 1952, the most, uh, definitely the most significant and extensive period of time for him, when he worked with Kitaoji Rosanji and lived in Rosanjin's compound. It struck me looking at this catalog, possibly for the first time, uh, how boldly Rosanjin departed from traditional modes, time classified, geographically classified modes of Japanese ceramics. For example, in this vase, which started off as the form of a 16, uh, 15th century uh, shigaraki jar, but then he carved it up to make it look like a basket. And he glazed it with a green glaze, a glaze called oribe, which is associated with Mino pottery in the early 17th century. So he was using a whole repertory of materials that he was gathering from the Japanese past, but he was using them totally to his own uh, pleasure and invention. And because Isamu Noguchi was working so closely with him, many of Noguchi's work from 1952 have this feeling of mixing, say, shigaraki clay and oribe green glaze. But Noguchi himself also brought his own uh, sense of clay combinations to some of the wonderful works that he made that year. Uh, he crossed paths with a great variety of Japanese ceramics makers who became other focuses of this exhibition. Many of them were unfamiliar to me, such as Okamoto Taro, who uh, sculpted the um, sun image for the 1970 Osaka Expo, but also made lots of ceramics. They were unfamiliar to American audiences as well, and who were at that point mainly familiar with the concepts of folk pottery, minge, or living national treasures. And we didn't really know or see a lot more beyond those confines. This exhibition, uh, Bert, both Bert and I felt, would be uh, an opportunity to present this range of very diverse ceramic artists and the diversity and complexity of modern Japanese ceramics in the immediate post-war decades. As the book cover reveals, of special interest to me was Yagi Kazuo, whose work you see on the back of the cover together with his signature and seal. Yagi Kazuo was a founder of the post-war exhibition group, Sodeisha which still continued to be active in the 1970s when I lived in Kyoto. And I heard a great deal about him at that time. I visited the annual exhibitions. I had a few brief encounters with Yagi, including a memorable one in a bar. And I heard about him from my friend, Rob Barnard, who was studying with Yagi at the Kyoto uh, University of Fine Arts. And I will never forget the cold, rainy February day in 1979, when it felt like all of Kyoto stopped breathing for Yagi's funeral. Yagi's famous work is probably this one, Mr. Zamsa's Walk, which he made in 1954 and debuted in Tokyo and Kyoto. Uh, and I was thrilled to be able to bring it to Washington, New York, and LA for the Noguchi exhibition. But we also featured other very important aspects of Noguchi's, or of Yagi's quite diverse repertory, including his beautiful polished black earthenware pieces, like the one on the left, or his um, unglazed shigaraki ware pieces, 
uh, like the one on the right. And indeed, I have to confess that my personal goal for this exhibition uh, was to introduce Yagi and the fellow co-founders of Sodesha, Suzuki Osamu and Yamada Hikaru to American audiences. I think that goal was realized through this exhibition, but also through the collaboration and uh, sympathetic reactions of Alice and Halsey, who became more and more deeply interested in ceramics as a sculptural medium, as a medium of sculptural expression, and to Joan, who started finding works by these three artists and other Sodesha members, bringing them to New York, putting them together in exhibitions so that other American collectors would have a chance to encounter them and start to live with them and uh, bring their presence to the United States in a very meaningful way. The impact of the uh, exhibition, generally speaking, I hope, was to ex help to expand our, that is to say, our, the American audience's a narrow understanding of Japanese ceramics. But it was interesting to discover as we were looking for exhibition material that Yagi's work already had a place in American museums. Uh, and for all I know in private collections as well, thanks to a very memorable exhibition that took place in 1966 called the First Japan Arts Festival. Um, I'm not sure that there ever was a second one, but Yagi and Kamoda Shoji, who was another focus of a recent webinar from Joan, and a few other young ceramic artists appeared in that exhibition as sculptors. And this work, one of Yagi's pieces to be in that exhibition called Queen, notable for its balance on its wooden platform with the polished black ceramic, was acquired, as you see, um, eventually by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And there were other collectors um, who boldly, early in the decades um, after the first Japan Arts Festival and before the Isama Noguchi uh, exhibition made their own forays into sculptural ceramics. I wanted to conclude by mentioning a few regrets uh, 20 years later, um, something, things I wish I had seen more clearly or written about more clearly in the Noguchi catalog. One was the clear, now, now 20 years later, much clearer to me, impact of Isamu Noguchi's approach to sculptural ceramics uh, on Yagi Kazuo and the other Sodesha members for that matter. But in this piece in particular of Yagi's Direction of the Wind, made in 1955, you'll notice five years after Isamu Noguchi's The Policeman, but Yagi's piece picked up the idea of creating a kind of stage-like framework in which uh, individual pieces of clay were uh, manipulated and arranged. I don't think that Yagi was in a very narrow sense copying Noguchi, but he was clearly inspired and emboldened to move ahead and make works like Mr. Zamsa's walk um, that he showed to his Japanese audience, much to their amazement. Another regret was that at the time of doing the exhibition, I didn't know uh, Hayashi Yasuo. I knew his name and we mentioned him in the book because he was a founding member of another post-war exhibition group, the group called Shikokai. But that group was very short-lived and somehow it escaped our attention at the time we were putting together our cast of characters. Otherwise, he surely would have had a place in the My last regret was that I didn't clearly see, as clearly as I do now, um, the way in which many of the youngest artists who appeared in the uh, Noguchi exhibition were still responding to 
the aftermath of World War II, and in, indeed to their own experience of it. They had gone to war, they had served, they had returned to Japan and picked up the fragments of their lives as artists to try to um, go back to where they had hoped to be. And in particular, the Yagi Kazuo work, which I translated uh, as memory of clouds, I would now uh, propose translating as memory of cloud and thinking of it as one of a series of works that Yagi did uh, referring to the atomic bomb and to how everyone in the 1950s was afraid of that possible event that would have destroyed us all. Finally, I'd like to close by saying how happy I am that uh, this cover piece of the 2003 catalog, a, a, another version of it, because Noguchi made a number of them using his own uh, well-established technique of plaster molds to make casts. But this self-portrait of Noguchi, although he didn't call it that, uh, is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, thanks to the energy of Monica Bigsick. Thank you, Louise. Uh, and I encourage all our viewers who are going to be coming through New York in the next year to come see that magical piece that is currently on view, in addition to uh, the exhibition that you will hear about from Monica herself. Uh, Louise, that was really insightful. And it sort of inspires me to think about um, another show and how we should do something on all of those that fell between the cracks in those early days and set the record straight and, and uh, readdress uh, that perspective on post-war ceramics. So stay tuned. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be pestering you. Don't worry. Let's, no, let's, let's try and fix it. Thank you, Louise. That was terrific. Uh, my next question is for Alice. And uh, Alice, I so well remember that day when you and Halsey came to my apartment showroom before I had my gallery and decided for the very first time to acquire two works from artists that you did not know, nor would you ever meet, uh, Suzuki Osamu and Kuriki Tatsuke. Uh, this was uh, in very early January, shortly after your 30th anniversary uh, celebration two days, three days before. As you and Halsey continued to build your collection and forged relationships with the uh, men and women who made the art in your collection, did the personal connections affect what you chose to acquire and from whom? And as your relationships develop, uh, deepened and developed through the years, were there any comments or insights from the artists themselves that profoundly changed how you looked at their work? and chose that particular work because of that. So Alice, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Thank you, Joan. Oh, and here are the two pieces that she was talking about that we bought and would never meet the artist who made them. Until these two purchases, our model for acquiring and buying was meeting the artists in their homes and workshops, talking with them, forging relationships and then buying from them directly. After these two purchases, we bought works primarily from dealers. Kitamura Junko is a good example of how our personal relationships affected what we acquired. Knowing her and her work well gave us the confidence to buy a piece of hers sight unseen. We first met Junko and her ceramic artist husband, Akiyama Yo, on a 1994 trip with Louise, led by the Tokyo ceramics dealer, Koyanagi Atsuko. It was four years later in 1988, when Halsey and I purchased a major work of Junko's. Garth Clark was hosting the exhibition, Kitamura Junko, one person exhibition at his gallery in New York City, where we lived. We wanted to buy a major piece from the exhibition before it opened to be certain there was a red dot on a piece when Junko arrived to give her confidence. But we were away from New York working, so we relied on Gretchen Atkins at Garth Park Gallery 
to select the four best works and fax us images. Then in a phone call, Gretchen said she thought this was the best piece in the exhibition. It was the most expensive work we had purchased to date, and it was the first piece we had purchased without seeing it first. We returned home in time to see the exhibition and celebrate with Junko and Akiyangyo. This was one of three exhibitions Junko had at Garth Park Gallery. During Junko's last exhibition at Garth Park Gallery, Akiyama Yo asked us to help him get an exhibition in America. We said his room size works wouldn't fit in a New York apartment and encouraged him to make smaller works that could fit into apartments and homes. Via mail, we asked Yo to make a work for us small enough to fit in our apartment and to keep our work by Junko from being lonely. This tabletop work is what Yo made in response. This was the beginning of a series of small works that he has pursued ever since. After the work arrived, we asked Yo via fax, it was fax then, how he created the surface texture on both the inside and the outside of the piece. Yo faxed back his answer, showing us that T028 is actually two pieces. He created the inside and outside separately and then joined them together with slip for liquid clay. Shortly after Yo had asked us to help him get a show in America, we were having dinner with Sam Morse, professor of Japanese arts at Amherst College, and Ann Morse, curator of Japanese art at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And Sam indicated that he was creating the, sh the show at Smith that um, Joan has talked about and a show at the Smith College Museum of Art on contemporary Kyoto artists. Sam wanted to know which ceramic artists we thought he should feature in the show. We suggested Akiyama Yo and assured Sam that Yo was making work small enough to ship from Japan for the exhibition. Joan Mervis was delighted to coordinate the logistics to get the works to Smith that's how Yo had his first show in America. So let's turn to Hayashi Yasuo, a good example of how our deepening personal relationship with the artist affected what we acquired. We were lucky to be able to purchase this work when we visited him in his Kyoto home in 2004. No Sound C is a rare example of Hayashi's talent for trunk loy boxes and passageways. Hayashi was reluctant to part with it because it was a best example of his work and it had a special meaning for him. He, expl he explained that he was commemorating his father's death and spirit journey through the passage of time and space to his ailing wife's bedside where he bid her farewell as he departed this life. Hayashi agreed to pass the work to Halsey because Hayashi was touched by Halsey's account of a recent similar experience when Halsey's father said just before he died, I have to hurry, your mother is waiting for me. You understand, Hayashi Yasuo said to Halsey. Hayashi Yasuo and Teruko were two of 26 of the artists, their family members and curators who came from Japan to see the contemporary clay exhibitions in Boston in 2005-06 and New York in 2006-07, which featured our collection. Halsey and I have had a long personal relationship with Koike Shoko, the first woman to complete the graduate program in ceramics at Tokyo University of the Arts. Our earliest encounter with Shoko was in the 1994 trip with Louise, led by the ceramics dealer Koyanagi Atsuko. Five years later, in 1999 at Gallery Koyanagi, we purchased this shell-lidded vessel, our first major work of Shoko's. Five years later, in 2004, we were lucky to be able to purchase this smaller work directly from Shoko when we visited her in her Tokyo home. Ten years later, in 2013, Shoko came to a party in her honor at our home. At that time, she saw her two lidded forms and loved having her photo taken in front of them. 
Shortly thereafter, Shoko sent us this document showing a third lidded form that went with the two we had and completed the set. She said, I have kept this work for a long time at my place as I like it very much and do not want to part with it unless it will be in a museum collection. Her document compared the three shell lidded forms from 1992, 1997, and 2004. The three works show the three different methods she uses to create lids for her forms. A perfect set with good balance, she says at the top of this document. Joan Murphy's graciously made it happen, and now we are happy to say these three sister works are about to be united at the Cincinnati Museum of Art as gifts from Jeffrey and Carol Horvitz, fulfilling Koike Shoko's dream. As Carol Horvitz says, they will be together again forever. Back to you, Joan. Thank you, Alice. That was wonderful and very touching. And I might add, um, nothing in this show that we have currently going on, no work has attracted more attention than the cover jar by Koike Shoko. From a collector's senior and junior, uh, one person who was very speedy got it right away, but um, I could have sold it four, ten, five times. It, it, her work is amazing. And the very sad fact is that she's retired from making pottery going forward um, due to health issues and she's 80 um, and just doesn't have the strength to do her technique, which requires a tremendous amount of, of hand strength. So um, I am, I'm thrilled to know that these three sisters will be together forever. And uh, we know from shows that Cincinnati has already done that they will be lovingly displayed and well used within their collection. Uh, thanks so much, Alice. So I am going to turn my virtual attention to uh, Monica. And uh, actually, first I should introduce uh, Monica to those of you who uh, might not know her. Uh, Monica is the curator of uh, Japanese decorative arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her specialty is lacquer and she grew up in Budapest, Hungary, receiving her PhD from the University of Budapest and a second PhD from the Mitsume Khan University in Kyoto in lacquer. She's curated several exhibitions at the Met uh, including Discovering Japanese Art, American Collectors in the Met, and Japanese Bamboo Art, the Abbey Collection, which traveled to several venues in Japan. More recently, Monica curated the well-received exhibition, Kyoto, Capital of Artistic Imagination, in which the works of many key contemporary ceramic artists were featured. She is the curator of the current Kimono style, the John C. Weber collection show, which I highly recommend to you for those of you who might be coming through New York in the next couple months. In 2018, she was named the first Diane and Arthur Abbey Associate Curator for Japanese Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So my question to Monica is, uh, Monica, in your forward to listening to Clay, you emphasize the North's important and prominently placed gifts to the Met. A curator, as we both well know, has many considerations to weigh when working with patrons in the shaping of a museum's collection. So what was your process for carefully selecting which works were destined for the Met from the North's collection? And how do you see the Met's collection in this field evolving from those seminal uh, North's legacy gifts in the future as we go on. So, Monica? Thank you, Joan. Good evening. It is my great pleasure to participate in this presentation. Building a collection involves finding, organizing, and displaying artworks. It is a reflection of how a collector perceives the world. The principles that produce a collection contain a certain worldview, associations and possibilities. Creating a collection is basically producing and organizing knowledge. When we started to work together with the North, the goal was to create a strong nucleus of contemporary Japanese ceramics for the mat. Except from its early history, 
when the first collectors of Japanese decorative arts donated Meiji period ceramics to the museum in the 1880s, 1890s, the Met hadn't been actively collecting contemporary Japanese or any Asian decorative arts. It is a relatively recent development that the museum decided to expand the scope of its collections and the Asian department became more active around 2010. While John Carpenter is now focusing on building the modern and contemporary painting and print collections, I'm involved in developing areas such as lacquers, ceramics, textiles, and more recently metalware. The first contemporary Japanese ceramics came to the collection around 2001, when Miyako Murase acquired a handful of contemporary ceramics with the help of John Mervis, including this Miyashita Zenji work. In 2003, when Professor Murase worked on her exhibition Turning Point, Oribe and the Arts of 16th Century Japan, she added contemporary teaware to the collection, such as the Shigaraki Bowl by Tsujimura Shiro, made in 1998, a Shigaraki stoneware piece with iron glaze, a gift of Koichi Yanagi. The great piece by Sakiyama Takayuki from 2004, Listening to the Waves, a gift of Mary Griggs' work followed in 2004 from the John Mervis Gallery. When the Norse generously offered to help augment the Met's contemporary ceramic collection, it was sporadic and not systematic in any ways. The first gift of more than 10 works came to the museum in 2015, and another even more significant gift of approximately 30 pieces in 2017. With the selection, I try to create a matrix that represents several trends and historical traditions, as well as avant-garde styles. At the same time, I wanted a selection that demonstrates Olsi and Holsi states their discerning eye. Their gift became a core collection that can be extended into various directions in the future. Many of the works are linked to the historical ceramic collection of the museum, but there are examples which exemplify avant-garde styles and new trends. The selected works include sculptural and conceptual pieces, along with more traditional functional ones. Often it feels that the idea of contemporary ceramics is tied to sculptural international trends. However, functional pottery made with traditional techniques is also contemporary and some represent new grounds. Works by Sodesha artists, including several great Yagi Kazuo pieces, female ceramicists such as Ogawa Machiko, Katsumata Chieko, and Kishieko are included in the North collection. Kyoto patterns, including Kondo Yutaka and Kondo Takahiro, Morino Taimei, Kitamura Junko, and Miyashita Zenji are also represented. Koyama Yasuhisa, who is a master of Shigaraki clay and revived the Anagama wood firing kiln traditions and also makes sueki ware. Or Kuriki Tatsusuke, who masterfully coordinated his clean forms with precise geometric bands. I have organized two installations on the Great Hall balcony featuring gifts from Ellis and Halsey North. The first introduced the selection of these gifts in a more or less chronological display, highlighting the continuation and renewal of certain technical techniques and traditions. The second one in 2018 explored the idea of abstraction as it existed in Jomon and Yayoi pottery, as well as in avant-garde unglazed compositions of the Sodesha artists. Many of the North works were incorporated into the Kyoto Capital of Artistic Imagination exhibition in 2019 to represent the flourishing ceramic culture of that city. These artworks, in conversation with the historical holdings of the museum, encourage our visitors to explore the objects from new points of view or to try to look at the old works through the lens of contemporary aesthetics. It is also important to note that the North gave their extensive archives, including notebooks, correspondence, photo documentation to the Met's archives. 
Many of their ceramic related books were given to the museum's Watson Library. These valuable resources will provide a base for further studies of contemporary Japanese ceramic art. This is actually one of the unique aspects of the North gift and the reflection of their worldview. As each piece in their collection is meticulously documented, the collection is almost autobiographical with details of their trips to Japan, meetings with artists, dinner menus, and many, many photographs. The documentation well represents their long-term conversation with the artists and the artworks. I thank you, Monica, for your comments. And I hugely look forward to future installations uh, in those balcony cases and what she, because she's so brilliant, can put together within the galleries and, and re-envision Japanese contemporary clay as fine art within the context of those magnificent galleries. Uh, my next uh, question goes back to Louise. And Louise, um, in Glenn Adamson's wonderful preface to this book, he compares the book's range and diversity of perspectives on the recent flourishing of Japanese ceramics to the 1950s Akira Kurosawa film Arashomon. After reading through the candid interviews, both the groundbreaking post-war Soudesha art movement and its leader, Yagi Kazuo, who loomed large for many of the artists, how did the recollections of this influential person and movement diverge among your interviewees? I mean, there you are with the Norths interviewing so many of these uh, favorite sons and daughters of Kyoto. Um, Yagi Kazuo must have been so the overhanging, arching uh, aesthetic director of this process. So yourself as a scholar who was already so familiar with both, did their commentaries open new insights for you in the process of writing this book? Louise? Thank you, Joan. Um, before I answer your question um, directly, let me say that your mentioning of Rashomon took me back not to thinking about the multiple meanings of truth, but to watching very early post-war Kurosawa films that I'd never seen before. Amazingly powerful black and white films about the world of Tokyo as it was in 1948-49. And in fact, last night I watched a film that was made in 1948 in Tokyo. And I kept thinking 1948, that was the year that Sodesha was formed. So when you plan your next exhibition, which I eagerly await, I think one of the aspects to think about in pondering how these uh, post-war ceramic artists themselves uh, with severe limitations on the one hand and with an incredibly unprecedented freedom on the other, that's a question that needs more probing. Uh, this is a portrait of Yagi Kazuo and the five other Sodesha members as of 1952, when they met uh, on top of the building that housed the gallery that was showing their work. And look at them in so proudly dressed in their fine jackets and Yagi even has a three-piece suit on. It reminds me of some of the many insightful writings that Yagi left about his early life that I think would be the basis for another exhibition about this time when he talked about going to an American, a secondhand store that sold American used clothing. And he happily, joyfully found himself a rust red tweed jacket that became his most formal dress for important meetings that he had in Kyoto in a place where the way you dress is very important. Uh, I think of Yagi, first of all, in, in this context, but I also uh, think of him 
of the context where he grew up, the area of Kyoto called Hojozaka, uh, on the east side of the river, where at his time, both pre-war and post-war, many important Japanese family workshops were operating. And Yagi was among the younger ones in this group. And he described how he had to be very careful walking up and down Gojozaka, that sloping street you see behind him, because if a more prominent older potter was coming down the street, he had to step out of the way and make sure that he showed proper deference. But Yagi was a powerful and confident person, even as a young man. Out of this deeply conservative environment came in the year 1954, the year he was strolling down Gojozaka, carrying his unfired work to the kiln, the communal kiln, to be fired in the cheapest, topmost place, which was all he could afford. This um, work, Mr. Zamsa's walk, was among the pieces he fired that year. And he um, surely startled the people living along Gojozaka when he walked by with these strange pieces on the board of, on his shoulder. And then uh, his work in this vein continued the following year uh, with and included the work that's now in the Metropolitan Museum, thanks to Alice and Halsey. And here he is again dressed very nattily for his exhibition of this work and others in Osaka. Yagi, as this wonderful portrait by, I believe, the photographer Domon Ken shows, was deeply concentrated on the execution, conceptualization and execution of his work. And this uh, concentration revealed itself not only in what he made, but as the next picture shows, in the way he must have glared at his students at Kyoto Geidai, who loved him and feared him at the time, as he taught them to break loose from unexamined uh, conceptions to realize their own goals for making ceramics. We saw many of his works, Alison Halsey and I, and Joan, I think, too in 2004 when we visited his retrospective at the Kyoto National Museum of Modern Art and saw the truly astonishing assortment of modes in which he worked and the, the thoughtful way in which he put his pieces together. So this man, Yagi Kazuo, uh, was someone who most of the artists that we interviewed inter mentioned in some way. And the frequency with which he was mentioned uh, was one of the inspirations to the three of us as authors in creating a really thorough uh, glossary of people and their relationships and index that sh would allow someone reading the book to, for example, look up Yagi Kazuo and find all the places where he popped up in the various conversations. Uh, beginning with our conversation with Hayashi Yasuo, who was of the same age as, as Yagi and belonged to a rival uh, group, the Shikokai group, and in a sense was an early rival of Yagi's uh, as they both thought to explain themselves as they were seeing ceramics as a potential medium for sculpture, not just as a, a utilitarian vessel. But one of the things we learned from Yagi, uh, from Hayashi Yasuo, is that uh, after Shikokai had dissolved as a group, and Hayashi was struggling to find a place for himself, not only intellectually, but financially, uh, Yagi Kazuo reached out to him, and invited him to participate in the Sodesha group, and so gave him another home for his work and his presentations in public, which is a very important role of these um, exhibition groups to create spaces that allowed the artists to show their work and allowed the public to find it. 
But another perspective on Yagi was that of Mishima Kimio, who occasionally went to Kyoto from her base in Osaka. And Yagi was a drinking buddy of hers. So she told about how they would hang out in bars and talk forever about their shared interest in the conceptual qualities of ceramics and how to bring those to life. Another uh, person who encountered Yagi was Koyama Yasuhisa, who as a young man in Shigaraki pursued the possibility of becoming an apprentice of Yagi's. But Yagi still at that point was struggling himself, didn't have money, and somebody warned Koyama that if he went to apprentice with Yagi, Yagi would have no money to feed or house him, so he better think twice. And he, he did. So unfortunately for him, he never had the experience of working directly from Yagi. Now, Miwa Ryukisho lived way far away from Kyoto in the town of Hagi at the western end of the main island of Honshu on Japan. But as a ceramic artist who was interested, deeply interested in the approach of Sodesha artists to ceramics as conceptual sculpture, he sought a membership in uh, Sodesha and was a member for a couple of years. But as he told us, he felt very much like a lonely outsider. The Kyoto potters who were the main members of Sodesha were deeply um, linked to one another. And Miwa Ryukisho sort of felt himself sitting on the outside, uh, trying to edge in and get involved in their conversation that took place at the annual exhibitions when the ceramic artists, as a matter of custom, were obliged to be present at the exhibition to talk to visitors. But when there were no visitors, they could talk among themselves and, of course, drink together. Fukami Sueharu was a younger Kyoto artist who did never belong to Sodesha, but he used to, in a sense, through his friendship with some of the Sodesha artists, sit at their feet in these gatherings that involve um, drinking and talking and smoking far into the night, posing questions to one another about the meanings of ceramics. Akiyama Yo and Kitamura Junko were genuine students of Yagi's at the Kyoto University of Fine Art. And they saw him in a different way as their mentor who very forcefully guided them, pushed them to become what they wanted to be, but what they could be with their very different concepts of work. He pushed them to develop what their concept of their own play work was and could be. There were, and, and we can't leave out Yagi Akira, Yagi's son, who um, was found himself in a very difficult role of being the son of surely a controversial and difficult father, and yet a father who, as Yagi Akira told us, lovingly guided his son in learning to look closely and think about what he was seeing and build up a repertory of shapes that would come to uh, influence the shapes that Yagi Akira made, so different from his father's and yet showing uh, the influence of his father's guidance and thinking. And Yagi also, Yagi Akira also told us uh, the very moving stories of how at the end of his father's life, when his father's hands were damaged by rheumatism, how Yagi Akira and another um, former student at Kyoto Geidai would execute Yagi Kazuo's vision and would polish the black pot burnished pottery and would inlay the metal plates into the late pieces that involved that technique. Interestingly, there are other Kyoto artists, notably Mori no Taime and Miyashita Zenji, just about a decade younger than Yagi Kazuo, who didn't speak of him because they were really focused on their teacher, Tomimoto Kenkichi at Kyoto Geidai, although Miyashita Zenji taught along with Yagi at the university. 
but their tastes lay elsewhere. And I, when I look at their work, I think very much of the sort of chromatic palette that influences not only Kyoto ceramics, but Kyoto textiles, Kyoto sweets, Kyoto food. They were part of a different world, although they were living side by side with Yagi Kato. One of the last artists I'll mention, Miwa Kyusetsu, again, growing up in Hagi as the younger Yusaku, Kyusetsu didn't talk to us about Yagi Kazuo as his ideal ceramic mentor. He talked to us about Peter Volkus. And that's because he spent six years living and working in California. So he was launching on another direction of Kyoto, uh, of ceramic development in Japan. And he talked about what it was like to go to a party and shake Peter Volkus's big hand and think about Peter Volkus's work. So um, I hope people reading who may own their own copies of our book will go to the index and choose a person or a topic and wander through the conversations with the 16 different artists, not to mention the five dealers, and find the threads that tie them all together. Thank you. Absolutely, Louise. And as a former graduate student long ago, there is nothing more valuable to me than an index. Uh, the book is <laughs> wonderful, but oh, the indexes, the indices are invaluable in enabling you to follow such threads that are not obvious when you read a book. And um, I know how time consuming and what a bore they are to create, but thank you for doing so. And another reason why I feel your book is truly invaluable, and there's probably ways that none of us here tonight have figured out how they're going to help us going forward with our research and coming up with new ideas to reinterpret this wonderful medium that we all love. But uh, surely that part of your book will be an invaluable part of the process. Thank you. Thank you for this illuminating thing. The other thing I should say is Tomimoto himself also put a great value onto appearance and tweed jackets. And I suspect that red tweed, probably Harris tweed jacket that Yagi Kazuo had was hugely impacted by his teacher's mandate on appearance. As well be. Uh, uh, to Monica, in the wonderful new balcony rotation titled A Perfect Imperfection in Ceramic Art, um, how have you and the Met's new curator for 20th century Western decorative arts, Abraham Thomas, pulled material from both of your collections to create such actually marvelous conversations between East and West? And so I leave this to Monica. The new installation on the Great Hall balcony is a collaboration with Abraham Thomas. And we had a wonderful time planning this exhibit and sharing ideas. This is our first interdepartmental project with the modern and contemporary department. And I do hope that it will be followed by many more. When we started to plan the theme of the new installation, we explored several ideas with Abraham and finally decided to feature imperfection as it seems to be one of the most intriguing aesthetic qualities prevalent in both Japanese and American as well as European ceramic art in the second half of the 20th century. Japanese ceramics, wood, lacquer, metal object can accrue sabi or signs of impermanence. This quality is easy to capture on the surface of Negoro lacquerware with precious marks of the vessel served on the trays and contacts with hands of many users. These ware marks tell stories of the objects as well as their owners. In ceramic art, imperfection can be captured in many aspects. The finger or palm marks of the potter, the use of shaping tools, the irregular shapes, asymmetrical forms, the rough textures, firing marks, cracks, and so on. Many of these remind us of marks on a human body created by age, illness, or injuries. They often convey the potter's delight in the accidental kiln effects. For centuries in Europe, it was believed that beauty was an intrinsic quality of artworks, but the Japanese tea aesthetic changed this tense 
and place the beauty in the eye of the beholder, not only involving the potters and the nature's active role in the creation, but also the creative imagination of the spectator. This aspect inspired many Western ceramicists and art collectors in the 20th century. It is the delight in discovering beauty in unintentional places, which became one of the principles of Western modern art. This, ex this exhibition examines how the idea of imperfection has inextricably shaped ceramic art in Japan, Europe, and the United States. The evolution of Japanese tea culture in the 16th century brought into focus the concept of sabi, or taking pleasure in things that are worn and incomplete, and wabi, in which objects of humble origin are repurposed to serve tea and lovingly repaired tea bowls are treasured. The appreciation of nature and simplicity is reflected in many tea utensils and folk ceramics. During the 20th century, Western ceramicists explored forms of irregularity that resonated with concepts like wabi and sabi, as well as with Japanese minge, folk craft traditions. Crucial to introducing minge pottery to the United States was Yanagi Soetsu, Hamada Shoji, and Bernard Leach's 1950s lecture and demonstration tour. American potters who attended such as Peter Vulkos and Warren McKenzie, found themselves captivated by the potential to reveal nature through clay. The spontaneity of Japanese pottery, furthermore, echoed abstract expressionist notions prevalent at the time, as did the attention to surface experimentation, direct intervention into the clay body, and even challenges to the role of function within ceramics. In Japan, a series of concurrent exhibitions raised the question of whether modern ceramic art was a medium for artistic experimentation. Inspired by avant-garde artists such as Isamu Noguchi and new movements in the art of flower arrangement, Yagi Kazuo and his circle began to create objet ceramics with new practical utility. Many clay artists discovered the freedom of expression through imperfection by exploiting techniques such as hand building, wood firing, and experimental glazing. In the process, they forged a new understanding of their field. Thank you, Monica. Um, anyone who's going to be in New York in the next six months or hopefully a year will enjoy seeing this uh, composition of things Eastern and Western and how they talk to each other. I would like to now ask my last question directly to Alice, although I have a joint question for her later. Um, in the course of, of, of so many interviews and so many uh, visits to so many talented clay artists, whose work do you feel most clearly reflects their inner character that was revealed to you through these rather unguarded interviews in the course of, I guess, two decades? Who would it be? Alice? We have two we'd like to suggest, Joan. Uh, first is Mishima Kimio, who is playful, and her witty trompe l'oeil work is joyful and colorful. At the same time, she is totally serious and determined. Using her ceramics, she makes social commentary about trash and uses clay with silk screening and transfers to create her extraordinarily convincing representations of discarded newspapers, cans, bottles, magazines, comic books, cardboard boxes, and bricks. We've known Mishima Kimio since 2004, when independent curator Maya Nishi took Louise and us to Mishima's studio in Toki, near Nagoya. I was behind in paying my assistant, she said, so they were all pretty worried. We'd never had visitors to the studio before, and you bought two pieces. The younger ones were all so happy. As soon as you left, I paid them all. I'll never forget that. It was always like a tightrope walk, always empty pockets. So if I got anything, I would spend it on making the next piece. But I kept on making pieces that wouldn't sell and really big pieces to boot. In 2004, Kimio was 72 
and she was struggling to pay the assistants helping her in her studio. She was determined to make what she wanted, even though she was not achieving financial success. She was determined to be an artist in her own terms. That same day in 2004, she and her assistants were working in the field next to her studio, redoing the ceramic newspapers to go into a gigantic four meters tall trash basket destined for an outdoor installation at the Nessay art site on Naoshima in the Inland Sea. She was making these huge things with no possibility of a sale. That is sto a story of determination. Look at how small she is compared to the height of the trash basket. Her success in the art world began only after her 2015 retrospective that filled the vast art factory Jonanjima exhibition space in Tokyo. Since then, galleries have honored her with multiple solo exhibitions and group show participation. She has carried on into her 80s and starting this year, her 90s. Despite the challenges of her chronic back problems, she travels around the world to attend the openings of exhibitions containing her work. In 2005 and 2006, she attended the openings at the MFA Boston and at New York's Japan Society of our contemporary clay exhibitions. Another artist whose work clearly reflects his inner character is Fukami Suiharu. Fukami is very precise and so are his graceful forms. There is a relationship between the purity of these finished forms and our understanding of his technical struggles of forming and firing to make them so pure. The purity of his forms results from his precise craftsmanship. Fukami is focused on what he is trying to accomplish. This kind of behavior goes back to his youth when he studied intensely on his own. In my 20s, he said, I saw all of the exhibitions I could see, read all of the books I could read, and attended all the lectures I could attend. Those experiences had a great effect on who I am today. Fukami devotes his energy into developing the techniques and technology that enabled him to realize his vision for his work. He invented a way to use a compressor to inject liquid clay into molds to produce his sculptures. He is careful to leave no trace of his touch. Fukami told us, I decided to narrow my focus and devote my life to sculptural porcelain with pale blue glaze. Where the glaze is thicker, it approaches celadon. Where it is thinner, it is closer to white porcelain. This variability is my gateway into a world of different hues on a single piece. At a young age, Fukami started asking older Kyoto potters for their thoughts about his work. He strapped his pieces on the back of his motorcycle and took them to the senior potters he considered his mentors. Those and other personal connections have had a major influence on shaping the development of his creative process. A longtime friend and mentor, Mori no Hiroaki Taime, advised Fukami, work every day. If you are serious about being a ceramic artist, then be an artist 365 days a year. Fukami wrote the motto on a piece of paper and attached it to the ceiling above his bed so he could see it every morning and evening. Later, Fukami found mentors in Italy who helped him submit work to the competition sponsored by the International Museum of Ceramics in Bienza. His extraordinary installation won the 1985 competition, pictured here. Back to you, Joan. Actually, I remember visiting that show in Faenza with my husband, Bob, and how uh, overwhelming that installation was. It was beautiful, and the works never looked so glorious in, in any of his shows in Japan. But I also must uh, commend you for your choice of uh, Mishima-san, uh, who is to this date the most tenacious woman I've ever met in my life. And uh, I believe she's the only uh, artist in the Soaring Voices show who made it to virtually every single installation, whether it was in Western Washington State or um, in Washington, DC. 
uh, she was there um, with her difficulties in her physical presence. Nevertheless, um, she felt it really important to be there with, as you say, limited financial means. So I, I think it's an especial, wonderful tribute that you honor her here tonight. Uh, my last question for Monica, which is a short question, um, and the last one to her, is as many of you who are listening to this panel tonight might be unable to travel to New York in our current situation, could Monica, could you give us a brief tour through the new exhibition and point out a few of the most interesting or provocative conversations that you and Abraham have contrived for us? On the Great Hall balcony, the first bay of the installation features Oribe there. Oribe vessels are typically irregular in shape and colorfully decorated with brush designs with a strikingly modern appearance. These unique vessels from the early 17th century used to serve a simple kaiseki meal prior to enjoying the whipped green tea were inspired by imported wine glasses. They were formed in the wheel and then molded into four-sided shapes before being decorated with V-like motifs, fern scrolls, cross hatching. The glazed drips and variations of the motifs reveal an appreciation of spontaneity. Suzuki Goro's two-tiered box given by um, Alice and Halsey North is inspired by Momoyama period Oribe Ver. On this two-tiered food box, he used the traditional dark brown and bright green copper Oribe glazes to depict whimsical motifs of crows, lamps, nude women, geometric pattern, and circular forms, both on the exterior and in the interior, as well as on the underside. He even used um, gold lacquer kintsugi to mend uh, cracks on the side of the box following ancient tea traditions. The next bay highlights the continuation of tea aesthetics to the present and its reception and interpretation by Western ceramicists. Traditional wood-fired kilns were of special interest to artists who wanted to explore both the random and controlled kiln effects and the textures produced by natural ash. When shigaraki clay is fired without a glaze, it turns a range of shades from golden orange to brown, and the surface is flagged with vined grains of feldspar. Paul Shalef, an American potter, was one of the first uh, who employed traditional Japanese wood firing techniques. Inspired by a visit to a New York exhibition in 1972 on Kitao Jiro Sanjin, Shalef traveled to Japan to study with master ceramic artists. He returned home to build his own anagama style wood fire and kiln, pioneering wood firing resurgence in the US. Like the adjacent 16th century freshwater jar, Shalef's vessel is striking for its textured, uneven ash glaze and drip effects. These planned accidents, the result of ash, are similar to the other encountered mistakes, including splits, warping, and glaze flows. He used solda repair to reference the Japanese kintsugi tradition we saw at Suzuki Goro's work. In the 1950s, the American potters encountered with Hamada Shoji and Kitawajiro Sanjin sparked a revived interest in Japanese pottery. Their embrace of historical styles, hand shaping techniques, and the use of the wheel was demonstrated by Hamada, sitting cross-legged facing the wheel and turning it with the bulb end of a wooden stick, were seen and interpreted as timeless. Japanese ceramics increasingly gained prominence in the American craft discourse and discussions included teaware and zen. Hamada worked with Bernard Leach for several years in England, who later became known as the father of studio pottery. Hamada was a major figure in the Minge movement and drew inspiration from various folk ceramic traditions, which resonated with the American idea of primitivism. 
The stole vessel by Kondo Yutaka from 1964 from the North Collection was perhaps conceived as a flower vase, but as it is double mouthed, the openings of which are barely wide enough for any flower to pass through, it shows sculptural qualities instead. The multiple necks on the vessel by William Wyman, an American artist from 1956, evoke an array of castle turrets or the valves of a trumpet rising and falling. Informal, subtle application of clay slip and glaze reflects similar surface treatments within Japanese Ninge pottery. The um, double spouted vase by Toshiko Takayazu from 1958, challenges the notion of function within ceramics. Informed by Minge principles of freehand brushwork, her expressive surfaces treat the ceramic body as a unified abstract canvas. Born to Japanese immigrant parents, Takayazu spent time in Japan in 1955, a formative period during which she met eminent ceramic artists including Yagi Kazuo and Kaneshige Toyo. This double bay brings together several directions in ceramic art from around the 1950s to demonstrate the various evolving trends, such as sculptural ceramics. Also hinting at that Vulcus representing the ceramic avant-garde and his circle in the Otis group embraced Minge traditions from which the Sodaisha artists wanted to be free. The use of slab construction in Peter Volkos's untitled vessel from 1961 liberates from the potter's wheel, allowing for a more freehand, asymmetrical, and essentially sculptural approach. In 1952, Peter Volkos attended Hamada Shoji's landmark American workshops, even kicking the wheel for him during pottery demonstrations. He admired Hamada's relaxed brushwork, which he considered rhythmical and dance-like, an effect that defines the dramatic splash of white clay slip on his own vessel. Kitao Jiro Sanjin was not associated with the Minge movement. He was a well-known calligrapher, antique dealer, and owner of a gourmet restaurant. He created tableware designed specifically to emphasize the presentation of Japanese cuisine. Rosanjin studied a wide range of clays and glazes and revived historically significant wave, such as Oribe, Bizen, Shigaraki, and Shino. This set of hand-built plates uh, was inspired by Ogata Kenzan style and later Rimpa artists modernizing elements and further stylizing the Rimpa iconography. In the spring of 1952, Kitao Jiro Sanjin offered Isamu Noguchi and his wife, Yoshiko Yamaguchi, the use of a 200-year-old farmhouse on his property in Kamakura. Noguchi established a studio beside the farmhouse, and with access to Rosanjin's Sanjin's kilns, he created a series of ceramic sculptures and objects. In the photographs, you can see Isamu Noguchi on the rear left, working with Kitao Jiro Sanjin on the rear right, at Kaneshige Toyo studio in Imbe, Okayama prefecture in May, 1952. While working in Kaneshige studio, Noguchi created a small sculpture that represents a figure with a concentrated expression and a cigarette stub clenched in the teeth. It is most likely a self-portrait of Noguchi at work as he was well known for chain smoking. Noguchi created a plaster mold for this abstract mask for unglazed Byzantine stoneware. The work or mask stands on three feet, as do many of his other sculptural forms. The original plaster mold is still a treasured property of the Kaneshige family. To my knowledge, altogether seven pressings were made from this mold, and most of these were given away as gifts to the members of the Kaneshige family and to close friends. Emerging from a pottery industry steeped in tradition, Several young post-war Kyoto ceramicists founded Sodesha, crawling through mud association to redefine clay as a valid medium for sculpture. They created abstract hand-built forms called objets, borrowing the term French surrealists use for found and repurposed art pieces. Here, 
in Yogi Kazuo's Direction of the Wind, Unglazed Clay Pipes from 1952, Yogi cut and rejoined Wilthron si cylinders and angles and embedded them into a square form. You can see the piece uh, as uh, Yagi fired it in a photograph captured by uh, Toshiko Takayazu, who visited his kiln in 1955, thanks to, um, thanks to our colleague uh, Glenn Adamson for introducing this image to us. In the next bay, we juxtaposed Peter Volkos and Akia Mayo's uh, work to highlight uh, the treatment of uh, the surface. Peter Vukos created this untitled ways or stack in 1967. Through his sheer force of personality and an appetite for material experimentation, Vukos helped to shift clay from a functional medium to sculptural one. Similar surface um, treatment and several approach to the uh, creation of rough, rustic, uh, Texture can be seen in the craggy, rusted frissures of Akiyamayo's Metavoid 202 uh, displayed next to Volkus's piece. This powerful and rough yet refined round table tabletop piece evokes a tree trunk long buried in the ground, while the partially exposed hemispherical form suggests a table emerging from organic material. Akiyama's exploration of the geological and physical forces intrinsic to clay, his constant experimentation with the medium and his unique approach, which prioritizes a tension between structure and nature, made him a revolutionary sculptor. In the next bay, we explored the ideas of imperfection in porcelain. Saladon and Seihakuji verbs, which were inspired by perfect Chinese examples, are typically characterized by sharp outlines, smooth surfaces, flawless glaze, and the hand of the potter is completely concealed with no visible traces. The four works here represent a completely different approach to the material. The uh, Kayo by Yoshikawa Masamichi from 2003, a gift from the North, um, is a successful combination of the purity of the porcelain with the love of texture, carved surfaces, and architectural forms. He left his clay thickly modeled with uneven surfaces and generously applied pale blue Seihakuji glaze, creating carefully controlled drips around the base. The last piece of the exhibition, The X Vessel by Gordon Baldwin, a British potter is um, adopting an aesthetic commonly found in Mingay pottery. He used the ceramic surface as a canvas for gestural mark making and subtle flashes of color. As the title suggests, this vessel takes its cues from an imagined archaeological object, echoing suggestions of the ancient and sublime scene in pelt and lunar fragments both displayed nearby in the, in the case. The large scale of X vessel, however, also offers a bold statement about the sculptural possibilities for clay with the small, almost hidden mouth at the top, giving just the slightest hint toward the idea of function. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. I hope that uh, whets your appetite for returning to New York and seeing this glorious exhibition. And also, it's very exciting to think about what the Met is able to do going forward with bringing material from various departments and juxtaposing them against each other. My final question, we're running a bit late, is for both Louise and Alice um, as co-authors of this amazing publication. So putting together this amazing and intensely personal book was clearly a labor of love and a heartfelt reflection on your devotion to the field of Japanese clay art. What do you want the readers to take away from the experience of reading and absorbing all 340 plus pages? We have three things that we'd like people to take away. The first takeaway for us is the artist reverence for the clay. 
As the introduction states at the core of each story is the artist's personal relationship to clay. Of all the themes, the meaning of clay as the medium was the most powerful. More than one of the artists described the interaction as listening to the clay. This attitude of receptivity and collaboration, rather than imposing intention on the material, emerged in the course of conversations as the most significant common attitude shared by all the artists, regardless of the specifics of what they made. Let us share the words of four of the artists. Kondo Takahiro certainly believes in listening to clay. He said to us, when I studied in the ceramics department at Edinburgh College of Art, I noticed my approach was different from that of the European students. I approach my work by asking, what does the clay want to be? It is a Japanese approach to think about the potential of the material, to listen to what the material has to say and try to imagine or feel what the material wants. That's the title of the book. Akiyama Yo also spoke to us about figuring out his role in helping the clay become what it wants to be. How can I help the clay? That mode of thought began to take shape in me and it connects me to the work I'm doing now. I use a blowtorch to harden just the surface of a ring of clay and watch cracks open across the surface. It is thrilling and beautiful. The clay itself is speaking to me. Takurezaki Ryuichi is known for using the coarse kind of clay that many other ceramic artists in Bizen would discard. Clay speaks a language peculiar to clay, he said, not a language as we know it, a language with which it communicates and makes you want to touch it. That's because clay is part of the earth. The clay spoke to me and told me how to use it. Hanate Masanel, in a similar way, is wholly committed to using indigenous hagi clay in glazes. He is also committed to his own technique of scooping and carving solid masses of clay rather than throwing on a wheel. I admit that hagi clay is very difficult to work with, he said, and yet it is very precious to me. I make my work by drawing out the characteristics of the clay. My ceramic style represents what hagi clay allows itself to do. The second takeaway for us is it takes a great deal of patience, time, and discipline to develop the skills and techniques that enable an artist to discover and execute a vision with the clay. All of the artists we interviewed for this book described their arduous training and practice to develop the skills they needed to create meaningful works. The artists received their training in various ways. Nine of the artists were born into pottery making families. They grew up observing grandfathers, uncles, fathers, and mothers working to support the family business and absorbed an understanding of the family skills and styles. The eldest sons knew they would probably inherit the family workshop, but each of them approached that pending responsibility in a distinctive way. Apprenticeships are the most trans traditional means of training. Kakurezaki Ryuichi, for one, apprenticed in Bizen with Isezaki Jun for seven years. Kakurezaki, Koyama, Yasuhisa, and Kondo Takahiro all train apprentices in their workshops. Four of the artists were trained in part at technical school. Technical schools were developed by Kyoto, Shigaraki, Bizen, and elsewhere to support the local ceramics industry and supplement training received from family members. Art schools as venues for education in ceramics became available in post-war Japan. The first art school to offer specialized training in ceramics was Kyoto City University of Arts. Tokyo University of the Arts did not open a ceramics course until later in the 1950s. The presence of outstanding artists as teachers in the art schools was important for bringing students into close contact with accomplished artists who helped shape their aesthetic sense and their careers. Art schools have been the avenue for women to enter the field. Those who have lived outside Japan for a period of time were exposed to a wide variety of artists and techniques. Morino, for example, spent three and a half years teaching ceramics at the University of Chicago. 
Ogawa Machiko studied ceramics in Paris in West Africa for three and a half years. Miwao Ryukisho spent one month each in Los Angeles and New York City. Miwa Kyusetsu XIII studied six years at the San Francisco Art Institute. Kondo Takahiro studied ceramics at Edinburgh College of Art, Scotland. Mishima Kimio had a Rockefeller grant to create work in New York City. And Fukami Suiharu made multiple trips to Italy and formed fast friendships there. And the third takeaway is how beautiful and individual the works are. Thank you, Alice. Uh, picking up on your last comment about the international experience that many of the artists we interview had um, makes me think, while I completely agree with the points you made about our takeaway thoughts, makes me think about to what extent uh, these artists are Japanese artists and to what extent they are artists of the post-World War II world as it evolved. And I think Monica and Abraham's exhibition beautifully illustrates the many, many ways in which um, we could have, in a way we could have written this book without ever using the word Japanese if we chose to talk about how these people found themselves to be artists and made themselves be artists through their own self-discipline and long, uh, careful thought. And I'm reminded of all the way back to Yagi Kazuo and the other Sodeja members in the late 1940s, talking about how thrilled they were when after the long dry period of Japanese censored life in the 1930s and then the war, they finally had access again to European art magazines. And they could read about Paul Clay and Miro and other people and Picasso and, and think about them and interact with them in their minds, if not literally by seeing their work very easily. And I'm, I'm reminded of the response of one artist friend of mine who has read the book to my delight, saying, this is what it's like to be an artist. And she's not speaking at all specifically of Japan anymore. So there's an interesting way in which these 16 artists that we've worked with and talked with at such length, both brought us to think deeply about how their having been born and brought up and trained in Japan affected them, but also how going to Chicago or going to San Francisco or going to New York or even simply reading uh, from afar um, made them part of the art world of the modern world, which is a world with far fewer boundaries than they had experienced growing up. I wanted to close with a comment. It's always a thrill as an author um, to hear what people have to say about the book you've written. And Alison Halsey and I have been delighted to get many bits of positive feedback from our readers. But one of them said recently to us that he read the book as a kind of history of post-war Japanese ceramics told through 16 personal perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy to hear that. And I, I, again, I think it's a perspective on the post-war world of ceramic art worldwide that um, talks about crossing as many boundaries as it does living within them. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, this book will have uh, legs, if you will, that will take us into the next couple decades of Japanese ceramics and its uh, passionate adherence. Thank you all three of you for making this such an illuminating evening. 
if you wish to um, uh, acquire this wonderful book, you can do it through our gallery. You can buy it on Amazon or you can go directly to the publisher itself uh, to acquire a copy. Um, just so that you know, this very large and substantial book is only $65. And um, if you buy it through us, shipping's included. Um, it's a serious book, as I said, over 340 pages. And um, it's not exactly bedside reading because you might have a heart attack lifting this book um, while you're lying in bed. But I would actually think that if you took it chapter by chapter and read one a day, you will be entranced with both the quality of the writing as well as the insights that you gain. Um, we have run quite late, so I am hesitant to go into a question and answer period. But the first question that did come in, um, I just have to ask because I'm interested in the answer, and it came in at minute five, um, to Allison Halsey, um, which asks, uh, what is the great fish that got away? What is the one piece you didn't acquire um, that you regret to this very day? Is there such a piece? I, I think that we are very, very lucky. And I would say there's not a piece that, that got away. Um, you and the artists and other dealers have made it so uh, uh, possible to collect. Um, Halsey? Hi, uh, to answer your question, John, there's several Vada Mata Hito <laughs> just missed. Um, we come into the gallery and you can see one behind me. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, walked it up. If I if I were collecting, I'd have a wall full of Wada's work. Um, I think he's just remarkable. Well, thank you for saying that, Halsey, because my show in March is called Wada Morihiro and painted Japanese ceramics. So he is the focus of the show, but, and Kamoto Shoji and others are secondary to the discussion about Wada So I didn't, that, I didn't, I didn't I, you, that, that was every, amazing. That gives me a reason to live longer. Yes, well, <laughs> we can work on that. I'll give you a preview. I <laughs> so you want to be the next second person online. <laughs> I'm, I too am a passionate fan. Okay, guys, so, so we're getting close to the seven o'clock mark. I just want to bring our audience who's hung in there through almost two hours up to date with what's coming up. Um, the show is available online as well as in person for those of you who are in New York. And in September, we will open uh, in coordination with Asia Week New York, our partner tonight with Masterworks by the reigning queen of ceramic sculpture, Ogawa Machiko, in a show entitled The Red Earth. This will be followed in late November by the first solo show outside of Japan by the important woman sculptor, Hayashi Kaku. Other publications that those of you who like to read and have the arm strength to lift something heavy, uh, this publication for those interested in Japanese porcelain, Kondo Takahiro Vessel Body Void, was published this spring by Japan's premier art publisher, Tsutaya. And it's an oversized hardcover collector's volume edited by the brilliant Joe Earl with bilingual essays by renowned experts and the artist himself. Uh, the title at the moment is sold out in Japan, but remains available through our gallery. Um, and of course, you could get two for one if you, you contact us and buy listening to Clay. I also, to give you a sense of the global reach of contemporary Japanese clay in the world at this moment, there are two other worthwhile publications and exhibitions of note. First, there is the modest but beautiful booklet, Touche le Feu, accompanying a brilliantly installed small show at the Musée Guimet in Paris of recently acquired uh, sculptural works by Japanese women clay artists. And that show will run through October. And for those lucky enough to be headed to Australia or actually reside there, we have many Australians listening tonight, um, the show at the Art Gallery of South Australia in Adelaide has produced a very handsome volume titled Pure Form Japanese Sculptural Ceramics and that extensive exhibition will run through early November. 
So get on a plane, everybody. Thanks again to our marvelous panelists, Alice, Halsey, Louise, and Monica, and to my amazing team behind the scenes that you guys don't see, Chelsea Cooksey, and most especially Bonnie Lee. Yes. And hey. thank you to all of you for your attention. And um, I'll let you know early next month what our autumn schedule will look like. Please stay cool, everybody. Stay healthy. And good night to you all. Thank you.